Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Baggage Claim, A Journey Through Mental Illness. I'm Katrina. I'm Julia, and this is a look at how you live with mental health in today's society. And I'm Mel, and we're here every Tuesday at 8, and we like to remind you guys that we are not, in fact, mental health professionals. We are mental health patients. If you do need to reach out to somebody, go ahead and check our description below in the comments, and we have linked you to some excellent medical health professionals and outreach programs that you can check out. Tonight's episode is about body image and how you see yourself in the world around you. With that, shall we dive in, ladies? Let's jump in. Yeah, let's do it. So first of all, what is body image? What is... Um, That's a great question. Yeah, what is body image to you, Katrina? <laughs> well, before today, literally, body image um, was like the... Well, it's the way I look, right? And the way I perceive myself, um, which I would mainly associate with weight. Um, yeah. What about you, Mel? Um, I mean, weight is a big one. Just sort of who you are when you look in the mirror and sort of matching up with sort of a, I'm, I'm shorter than way, I'm way shorter than average and I'm way, you know, not as thin as someone who's as short is. So, I mean, yeah, all of those, those things about yourself that you hyperanalyze and don't like when you look in the mirror. I mean. Totally. I mean, it's something we all have, right? We all have body image. It's the way we see, like you said, Katrina, it's the way we see ourselves, how we feel about that, and then also how other people, how we think that other people perceive us. So how we're imagining that others see us as well as a part of our body image. And that can be in, influenced by environmental and societal factors um, and in individual factors as well. So it's influenced by a lot of different things. And um, our body image can be positive, negative, or both. Um, I think most people probably have a mix, but of course there's people at either extreme too. How would you guys think that your body image on the range of healthy to not healthy, where would you say that you fall? Is we new going? <laughs> um, I'm getting a little bit of a delay, so my apologies um, if you, the audience, are as well. Okay, so I'll go first and then Katrina can go back. Okay. Um, I love I love broadcasting live on the internet. It has it's fun. Been, but it definitely helps with my body image. <laughs> <laughs> oh my can God. you what was the I it was hard to hear. Can you ask? Uh, I was just saying do you sure? I was just asking where you thought you fell on the range of healthy to non healthy body image. Ooh. That's such a tough question, um, because it probably varies daily. Yeah. Right? Like um so maybe I'm really unhealthy because it, it is like that. I think that's natural. I mean, in my opinion, maybe I'm unhealthy too. <laughs> but, you know, a positive body image can help you feel really co confident and comfortable in your own skin. And a, low, a, low, um, a negative body image can really contribute to low self-esteem and, and really like your mental health overall can negatively impact your mental health and a lot of different ways contributing to depression, anxiety, phobias, many different types of things. So um, this really does affect every aspect of our lives. Yeah, and I, it's probably one of those things too that is, is diagnosable or not diagnosed as often um, in the sense that people don't, you know, unless it's an extreme, people don't seek treatment. For yeah. It. True. true. Yeah. I wouldn't have realized until some of the stuff we read about to do tonight's topic, how much I almost would say that, like, I would have thought I was healthier than I actually am based on a lot of what I learned. And that actually, it helped, you know, it was like, oh, it was a shocker, but it helped me. But I had never put it, you dismiss it as just a thing, but it's actually part of your mental illness. Like the way we're, what we're talking about today is like, no, it's like the anxiety and the things that you do to your body issue and your mental image and your all of these things at the same time that you're having your anxiety and depression. And I never, I don't, 
I, you know, I related eating too much or eating too little, like we first kind of, when we first started out to my, you know, body issues, but not some of like the ways I treated myself when I looked in the mirror as a result of my mental illness. So this one was, it was a broad topic, but it was surprisingly enlightening for me when I started to really look at some of the stuff we've talked about, like we, we're going to go over tonight. And it's all cyclical, right? Like it's like, you have anxiety and so it affects the way that you eat and then the way that you eat affects your anxiety or depression or whatever it is and so on and so forth and it goes round and round. Um, yeah, or like the way you look, um, you know, and you don't like it, like of course I'm gonna be depressed about that. Or right. have some depressive thought um, that's associated with that. Well, I mean, so like if you take the depression and you add the feeling, it, like it help, it pushes, it's a, it's a pushing factor where it's like, I'm depressed. And then I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, of course I'm depressed. Look at me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's, I mean. So let's look at some of the numbers and see where we fall in the range of um, the spectrum. 50% of women use unhealthy behaviors to control their weight. 50% of women use unhealthy behaviors to control their weight. I can't believe that. I mean, I can, but it's really shocking. And by unhealthy behaviors, we mean anything from fasting to um, laxatives to just disordered eating to extreme dieting, all different things. 70% um, of 18 to 34 year old women don't like their bodies. Oh, this is a good one. The average woman is 5'4", five, 5'4", four, five four inches and 165 pounds. And the average model is 5'11 and 120 pounds. How do you guys feel about that? <laughs> well, that 70% is pretty staggering. And if you're giving someone an, what's generally looked at, I mean, by that number, it's an unachievable goal because that represents an exponentially smaller average proportion of our society that are put out there and glorified to us as the proper thing to be to the current standard. And what? 65% of us aren't that at all, like c can't physically be that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, it's like the odds are stacked against you. And if you have mental health, like everyone does, you start to, you start to go down the road. It just doesn't help. And like you were saying, Katrina, 70% of 18 to 34 year old women don't like their bodies. I mean, that's just such a st sad statistic. It just makes me really sad inside. Well, because we know we like, struggle and women younger and younger than us are feeling oh, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, if I'm dealing with it, like, I'm, I'm sure majority of women, like, I guess, like, it makes sense that a majority of women are dealing with that as well. Right, that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that just goes, I mean, we're going to go down that road, but, like, how much culture and social media might have an impact impact on somebody's life. Definitely. Yeah, we will get into that for sure. Um, this doesn't just affect women, though. Men are also affected. 43% of men are dissatisfied with their bodies. 37% of men who binge eat experience depression. And just like Barbie, men have G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe has a 16-inch bicep and 29-inch waist versus the average 13 inch bicep and 40 inch waist of, of most men. 40 inches versus 29 inches. I mean, that's a huge difference. Huge. I mean, I know that from being married to a gentleman who has, you know, a couple, he loses or gains a couple of inches on the waist and it's, plus that's like the ones pulling when you survey guys, because it's not something that they are going to necessarily admit how much is that number skewed to one way or the other? Because that's the ones that were willing to admit it. And that's a pretty big percent. If you consider that, I bet there's this, I mean, I have no, it's only anecdotal, but I'm willing to bet knowing having a lot of best friends, like my close personals are, are men, I would be willing to bet that at least half of those men that were surveyed didn't necessarily, or maybe a, a few of them, a third of them didn't necessarily answer honestly about that because of the stigma attached on that front. Right. Yeah, definitely. If you go back to I that link. Think, 
Oh yeah, I can go back to it. I don't think that uh, you know we talk about men enough in in a lot in mental health, really, in um, in in body issues for sure. Yeah, I agree. Although it's, I mean, it's getting better, but there's still a big discrepancy. So if you scroll down, there's some uh, additional statistics. All right, scroll it. Eighty-nine percent of girls have dieted by the age of seventeen. That's almost. I mean, that's. 89%, almost 100% of girls have dieted by the age of 17. 42% of girls in grades one through three want to lose weight already. 45% of boys and girls in grades three to six want to be thinner. And 51% of nine and 10 year old girls say they feel better about themselves when they're dieting. So, I mean, that's really like, yeah, I mean, these statistics are crazy, and it really says something about the parents as well, but it means the parents are dealing with these same issues that we are, and the same issues that they're passing along to their children. It's tough enough to be a kid without dieting. I mean, you know what I mean? And having to, I mean, that's, that. I mean, that says something about all of us as adults in the lives of children that, unfortunately, at Basically, that's the age where they start becoming aware of their selves on a broader scale, where they start having significant personalities and they begin their impressionable years. I don't want, I mean, I, I don't even have children and I don't want the children in my life or around me feeling that way. I don't want to feel this way at 40. I definitely don't want a nine-year-old boy or girl feeling like that. And like you said, it's a pass down from parent, parental, but it, that is being beat into us societally mm -hmm. so it, it's it's so uh, gosh absolutely i mean i remember in high school having a girlfriend whose mom anytime we she put something in her mouth would say something to her about that wow um, so you know i think there is a correlation too to young children feeling a certain way outside of a media or social perspective but within the family how did your friend react? Well, it was I. It was like something we like joked about. Um, oh, you know, like I don't want to say her name, but is uh, is eating again? And like she, because she would always like have snacks in her in her purse and stuff. So food, you know, is definitely an issue. But it, it was an issue that definitely came from her mom. Wow, my dad had a bad habit of uh, doing that kind of thing to my sister and I as well, where it was like, I think he came from a well-intentioned place, but from his upbringing, that was the way that he sort of translated, making sure that you weren't fat or ugly. And I, again, I don't think that he was necessarily a malicious person, but it doesn't matter when you're a young woman and you're, are you going to eat that? Are you sure you're going to eat that? And you know, for me, it was like I had sort of the adverse reaction, which is like, yeah, I'm going to have two of them. Like, I'll I'll eat and be whatever I want to be. And that's not going to be a healthy situation either. And so you either have the abstention or the binge situation. And With kids as well, like, there's also the, the, a, a different way that it goes where your parents tell you eat everything on your plate. Yeah. Um, I think that's a dangerous um, thing to say. Because you should eat until you're full, you know, you know that you're satisfied and full. You shouldn't have to eat everything on your plate. Um, I think that's something that we were taught that um, should not be taught, not be done. We're associating yeah. negative behavior to food. So it becomes like that's you feel true. guilty about eating or you feel bad about yourself if you eat. Or it, it becomes like associating the food itself not just with your body image, but like with your well being, like with your being, like what am I, you know, I feel guilty that I ate that or, and those start to be, that will just give you uh, it's disordered eating is how you put it earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because then it just starts consuming your thoughts Yeah, and you get into that circle. But, um, you know, I, I agree. Like once we started kind of reading I always just associated body issues with like weight. Um, 
of course it's not just weight, right? Like it can be the way you, you look at yourself or if you don't like a mole, um, Julia pointed that out earlier. Like, I think that's a great example. Um, and these things start when we're, when we're kids, right? Like usually these issues are. Yeah. They're formed at the time of before puberty or around puberty or before that even. I mean, this was saying that six-year-olds are dieting already. They barely like developed an appetite for anything. I mean, can you imagine like dieting before you've learned like what kind of food you even like? Because that's essentially what kind of what you're talking about when you start to get six to nine years old. I that's a little heartbreaking. I mean, I just we should be focused on more things. It's too bad that we associate so much to that that our own children. I mean, it's got to be a healthier way. I don't know. Yeah. So speaking of healthy, let's talk Can about social media. Statistic? Which statistic? Oh, okay, perfect. No, you're good. Yeah. No, nothing. Oh, okay. Oh, wait. So no, social nothing. media is a huge <laughs> part of our lives nowadays. It can be it can be positive. It can also be very negative in its implications for us. So what do, do you guys have a social media footprint and what's your experience with social media overall? Yeah, I do. I mean, okay, I have, you go. <laughs> okay. I I have a like ju like ju I think just an Instagram and like a LinkedIn if that's part of this social new social media, um, and it shocks me. Um, actually, more than like a body image thing of just how much how many people um, edit their photos like to make their bodies look kind of like crazy. Like how can you have that kind of body like a model, right? Definitely. Um, I think that's more my issue um, of like, why all these, why, why is this happening? Why do you feel like you need to be doing this? Um, so mine's more of a concern. Yeah, there's actually, I mean, of course, of oh, course I think about, I mean, also, of course, I think about it like to myself and my body, but like really at first it's a concern more than anything. Yeah, there's actually a, um, a, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because there's actually a term now called Snapchat dysmorphia, where um, it's like a literal term that people are like having dysmorphia from Snapchat photos and Snapchat filters. Um, and plastic surgeons everywhere say that patients have actually been coming in with Snapchat filtered images to show what they want done to their bodies. Wow. Yeah. One of my favorite subreddits is, is, is Instagram reality where they show like their Instagram shot and then like what they look like in real life. <laughs> Cause it's like, I mean, what are you, why is as a society do we, or do these women and men feel the need to do that to themselves? Right. But I guess it's, it's part, I think that maybe that's a, um, a mental, you know, a mental illness in itself. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's certainly something that's new that's cropped up, but because when you get to a point where you're talking about like digital altering, digitally altering pictures on that level, it's one thing to like Snapchat filter yourself, but to actually go and ask someone to do something to your face that is just a digital alteration or to your the rest of your body. Also, it brings up kind of an ethical question for doctors. I would say, I mean, if it's, it's all things being equal, I mean, where does the doctor draw the line on what they're willing to do to a patient in, you know, the interest of satisfying something that seems unattainable? And I don't know, like, why aren't we comfortable with ourselves? Why are we so uncomfortable with ourselves at this point that we don't have the ability to, like, that's a pretty blurred line. And that is mental illness when you start talking about like, cause that's going for some, some, from something that is literally supposed to, I mean, when you boil it down, that stuff's supposed to be for fun is look, I can turn my you know skin purple or I can put ears on myself or flowers on my cheeks, but not like, you know, shaving off parts of my cheekbones, potentially putting me at risk for, you know, other diseases or th you know physical disease that is unnecessary to my body that just seems like i don't know i feel like we should be doing better by each other than i mean to build each other up that we are not 
you know, a, we're not a Snapchat filter. We're not a profile picture. We're human beings. Like, right. But it's no wonder that we become so obsessed with this concept of perfection when we're constantly exposed to all these edited photos that are far from reality every hour of every day. And you get social influencers yeah, I mean, who are there... based on that. 100%. I pulled up some. I pulled and, up some you know, numbers. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. I mean, I'm on the short scale as well. I'm under five feet, so like, um, I know Mel was like saying that's you know an insecurity of hers um, as well. So I just wanted to to bring that up. Yeah, we're a good what eleven. Both of us are about a good eleven inches, so we're almost a full foot shorter than what the idealized woman is put out there for us to believe. That's like we physically cannot add a foot to our height. It's like, and I mean, God knows I've had very giant heels in my days where I've tried to throw them on and like do the dance of you know I look I look how much taller I am. But yikes. Cause that's just not, I can't add another foot without still serious <laughs> significant heels. Exactly. I, mean, I'm, I can't, I know that I can never be a model. Yeah. But actually, but I, that other four foot 10 girl or 11 girl on Instagram who has all those cute pictures and a really banging body. Why don't I look like that? <laughs> so totally. you know, that's when I can start like playing when you see something that like, you more relate to like oh that person's kind of like me but i don't look like that right yeah we call that um i'm in a recovery group and we call that compare and despair when we're um yes. comparing like that but um we're judging ourselves against the highlight reel of someone else and and saying this is what success and happiness looks like even though these aren't real images and this is just your highlight reel i want my whole life to look like this Especially uh, those influencers, man, like flying everywhere. And I think there is that. We've talked about it in the past about that sort of keeping up with the Joneses thing. Some of that is body image now. I mean, some of that is like having the best selfie and staring, you know, meaninglessly into the thing. Or I have a good friend who's constantly like, you know, I don't understand these people who put up their profile pictures that look nothing like them because then, you know, when you do understand them, it, it, how can it, because it's like, you start buying into that too, whether it's true or not. And that's dangerous. It is just like everything else. Cause that can put you in a bad situation mentally too. Just to um, show how prevalent is social media is in our lives. Um, I pulled a few numbers and 69% um, of us adults use Facebook. 75% of 18 to 24 year olds use Instagram. And 73% of 18 to 24 year olds use Snapchat. And 75% of all those people use the app, not just once a day, but several times per day. So that's how often we're exposed to all of this, all of this um, assault against our body image. Oh my God, all I can think of is like, I'm so glad I wasn't a kid during these times. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh. Because I can imagine like having to be a parent and navigate this. Because um, navigating it as an adult is is hard enough. And even as kids, it was plenty difficult. Yeah. When I was nine, it was plenty difficult. I didn't have a Facebook or a timeline or a social media or it was bad enough having you know magazines and TV. I, I wouldn't even I. <laughs> I definitely sympathize with my uh, family friends that have children in these times. Is like, how do you, if you're someone that's looking not to want your kid to diet and someone who doesn't want, you know, doesn't want their seven or nine or whatever year old feeling like I need to diet. That's a huge undertaking. That's, I mean, you can understand why some parents let it fall by the wayside because that's a lot of work to, I mean, it doesn't say that, that it doesn't preclude them from responsibility but it's hard. That would be difficult. Shout yeah, out, parents. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't always include food, right? It might not be food related. Um, and that's kind of even trickier. I don't know. This social media thing. I know. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, um, 
it makes me grateful I don't have kids. I'm sorry, but that's it makes me want to do better for the ones who do that want to have yeah, their children. Absolutely. I mean, we it's I, I wouldn't even begin to think about how to undertake that, and that's <laughs> shout out, you guys, keep up the hard work. Some of the other ways that um, we, I know you, one of you was just saying it's hard enough for adults, let alone kids, and it is hard enough for adults. I mean, I know people, adults, grown up people, who will decide if they're going to eat or not that day based on how many likes or comments they got. Wow. You know, like they'll decide like their entire self worth is based on this feedback that they're getting through this this social media abyss. Um, and then that's affecting their body image so much that they're deciding if they're going to eat or not, you know, verging on, on having an eating disorder. So it's like people, you know, put up pictures and stuff in a way to get, you want that, those comments, right? Like you want that good feedback. Um, so that must be part of it. Like you, like to, to get that, um, Positive. Uh, yeah, positive reinforcement. It's, Thank you. Yeah. Dopamine drip, uh, you know, yeah. that yeah. shot of endorphins that you would get from maybe exercising or, yeah. and it's sad that that is, I mean, look, I've got a semi, you know, viable social media life that I, where I have friends and people that I, cause you know, podcasting for so many years and all of these things. And you, it takes a long time, even to this day, after having that for eight or nine years is like, yeah, sometimes you hit that three or 400 followers and you're like, look at me. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, you need to calm down a little bit. You don't know any of those people. And so it's hard. Any rational human, especially on a bad day is going to go, well, I have this many followers on this, or I got that many hearts on my thing. And that, but it gives you a false sense of that thing because it's not going to get if you were to exercise every day or learn a language or read a book for those amount for the you know five times a day you check your snapchat or your twitter or your whatever if you were to say like read a book chapter read a page of your book even just not even go for a chapter just a page of that book there's going to be so much more longer term positive to your mental and then ultimately your body image and uh, I mean, because those those hearts and up likes are very fleeting and they change on a dime. You know, I get 10 likes in the morning. And like Julia said, it's like, ooh, I needed 12 to eat today. And then I get 15 later and am I allowed a snack? I mean, that's imagine imposing more. We can't like we can't be imposing more, you know, these nonsense punishments on ourselves when there's already plenty of adulting and being a growing child in the world, there's enough pressure daily that we don't need to be inflicting it on ourselves from uh, that. I mean, I feel like there's a healthy way we can interact with social media that we're not to yet without understanding things like mental illness. Mm -hmm. Cause it can be, it, it can be a tool for good. We can talk it to can people be. thing. <laughs> there's just a lot of triggers. The... Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, go. I was just going to say there's, there's so, so many triggers online when it comes to body image, just, um, you know, in the form of posts about weight loss or um, unrealistic goals or unrealistic ideals of body sizes or extreme exercise. Um, you know, it can trigger this desire to lose weight by any means necessary. And that's when people get into trouble. Yeah, there's no it's like always, it's about striking a healthy balance. And like you're being sold all these, you know, weight loss, 10 day weight loss things on Instagram and, you know, ads on Facebook. Like it's. And you get to a point where you're like, do I need that? You know, people, influencers promoting like shakes. Yeah, exactly. Well, there are some ways to um, kind of try to take care of yourself when you're online, when you're on social media. Um, one is to be mindful of who you follow. Um, you know, you don't have to follow, it can be motivating to follow food or fitness, um, people or, or blogs or different outlets, channels. Um, but, um, 
you know, make sure that you're following ones that promote positive messages and that make you feel good about who you are, who you already are, not ones that make you feel bad about yourself. Um, and also don't be afraid to unfollow people who aren't good for your mental or physical health. Um, you know, you don't have to stay following someone forever just because you started. And you can also, um, I think you were just saying this, Mel, that it can be a positive place. It can be a positive place. So be that voice for change and advocacy and don't be afraid to speak out and use your, use your voice. That's a really good one. And yeah, those are all good. So, well, and especially that last one, because people that do have, there are a fair bit of people out there who have a few thousand followers. And I've seen a, a lot of, you know, someone will jump in there and say something really cool to somebody. And you will see 10 or 12 people jump in and say, hey, stop it. And then actually, I mean, for as many times as you get the death threats and the horrors, I mean, I see a lot of people on my feed because I have worked on curating my feed where it's like, I'm feeling really bad about my mental health today. And so I've tried to find those people in my space so that, cause it's like, well, I know if I know anything about anything, it's feeling really bad about my mental health today versus maybe I feel better on that day. But it does take, I mean, it's just like anything else you have to curate it. And so I think for some people, I think you have to weigh, is it worth it? And which media, social media sites are worth it for you? Cause some are better than others in the way that you are able to healthy curate them. You know, where there's 8 billion people on Twitter or Snapchat, it might be easier to keep 50 or 70 people on Facebook because it is a big community, but it's not necessarily a big community if you keep it in the groups or you keep it in things that can be responsible. But that's tough too. I mean, it's just about, you have to care enough about yourself to understand that that out there is affecting your body image. And I think that even with me learning what I've learned from our episode here is how much more things do actually affect you than the basic ones. Say, okay. It's not just the Snapchat, it's the fitness stuff too. It's. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Any last thoughts on social media ladies? Be careful with it. Use it Absolutely. responsibly. Curate your own journey through it. Um, you have to be your own advocate for that, that, just like everything else. We are like we yeah. talk about having to be your own advocate for your mental health first. That is part of it because social media is a part of our lives, whether we like it or not. So we have to figure out a way to manage that. Yeah, I think it's it's hard, but yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's hard just controlling your, yourself <laughs> not to follow those people. Because it's easy. Yeah. It's a really short road. It's not as hard as like, you know, you have to, sometimes you have to make a snack, but you can go right on the fitness side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, should we talk about body dysmorphia? Yeah. I think so. What is body dysmorphia, first of all? Um, it's a mental health disorder in which you can't stop thinking about one or more perceived flaws in your appearance. And this, we're talking about a flaw that either appears minor or, or can't even be seen by anyone else. Um, but you may feel so ashamed and anxious about it that it affects huge aspects of your life. You may stop going out socially. It may cause you significant distress. Um, so it's a big deal. I don't know if either of you have any experience with dysmorphia. Not to the extent that I realized, I guess. I mean, I didn't realize that, not to the extent of some of the stuff that we've actually got in terms of like what we read about, but understanding it as a mental health disorder at large, like like PTSD or like bipolar or like, I, that made everything make so much more sense and why it is a facet of all of those things. But I don't have a ton of experience with some of the, I can understand the mentality, but not the, the experience, I think. All right, you, Katrina. Um, this one was really eye-opening to me. Um, be for some reason, I just had never considered this. Okay, I knew the term. I knew, you know, it was out there, but I just didn't consider this. Um, and, yeah, like, I think I have def definitely have experienced 
some body dysmorphia issues, you know, even just related to my height. Um, so absolutely. I've definitely experienced body dysmorphia disorder. I, um, I, um, believe that I'm overweight no matter how thin I get, no matter how underweight I get, well, I'm told that I'm underweight. Um, I always believe that I'm significantly overweight. And that's what I see when I look in the mirror is someone who's overweight. Um, no matter what else other people tell me, it doesn't change anything. I mean, that's so hard. How do you handle that? Do well, I've worked on it. I mean, I continue to work on it in therapy because that's really the best treatment for BDD is, um, is, um, CBT, which is something we've talked about in brief before, which we'll eventually do an, an episode on, but um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a treatment for BDD and um, other forms of therapy as well. So it's something that I continue to work on, but um, it's just, at, at some point you just have to resign yourself to say, it's not what I see, but I understand that that's what other people are telling me, so I'm not gonna try to lose any more weight. So changing um, your and, thoughts. Like, yeah, changing, changing your thoughts. Turning it around on itself a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. That's so tough. Um, I'm so sorry that you deal with that and that people um, every day deal with that. Because that's just, the, I'm, I can't imagine the stress that would cause on you. And, and anxiety and depression and all of the above. Yeah. I think we have a video actually to play to explain a little bit more about it and eating disorders. Yeah. So this is. I wish it was better understood. Right before you start this, I wish it was better understood because until we did this, I know I keep harping on this, but until we did this episode, there's a lot of things that I never drew into that that I wish I'd known more about. And I think educating, I mean, especially with other mental health patients, but even people outside of mental health understanding it. Yeah, we this video was pretty interesting uh, about BDD. Yeah, and it's uh, about five minutes long. We are gonna let it play through. Um, so hope you enjoy it, and we'll be back in about five minutes. Questions in the thing if you need. Sorry, one second. Can body image problems affect our mental health? Body image problems can feature in a range of mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, and social phobias. In the case of body dysmorphic disorder, people could have a very distorted perception of their body and their appearance. Mirrors and windows are my enemy on the days when I'm having a body dysmorphic disorder flare up. I don't think anyone is 100% happy with their appearance or I'm yet to meet somebody who is. Um, but for me, this was just to the extreme. People use mirrors within BDD to check their appearance in order to gather more data or information about how bad the part that they fear looks awful actually really is. The lowest point for me was probably the third time I tried to kill myself. I felt disgusting, uh, didn't want people to see me. BDD is an obsessional anxiety disorder. People with BDD are sometimes seen as narcissistic because what is perceived is that there is an obsession with how they look. Actually, that's what happens as a result of the testing how they look. And their aim, typically, is just to look acceptable and normal. BDD is a shame-based disorder. A lot of people sit in silence with it because they don't know that it's an illness and that it's a treatable illness. For some people, negative body image can be linked to disordered eating. I was sectioned under the Mental Health Act because of anorexia. Then going from a size 4 to a size 20, using food as a compulsive overeating disorder to kind of numb myself in a different way.
The commonality between BDD and eating disorders is disordered eating, so that the eating potentially is disrupted. Now, a lot of people with BDD have a preoccupation and distress about an aspect of their appearance that doesn't have anything to do with eating. But for those that have an appearance problem that is, for example, their whole body shape, then, then that quite often includes disordered eating. There's blurred lines between my eating disorders and my body dysmorphic disorder. They do shift and it's hard to tell the difference sometimes, but it is useful, so useful for me to have that language around which to talk about both these separate conditions, as well as, you know, depression and anxiety still are things that I battle with regularly. For me, my eating disorder was about addiction, obsession and control. But I couldn't see what other people could see. And at the time, I didn't even realise that I got a problem. Let's be honest, like, if you saw me in the street, you're not going to think, Phew, alpha male. <laughs> Much more likely to think, oh, vegetarian. A body image problem can become extremely dangerous. In the case of anorexia and bulimia, it may lead to very serious long-term health problems. And in the case of body dysmorphic disorder, it has one of the highest suicide rates of any psychiatric problem. So what was your kind of like breakthrough moment? Somebody said to me, let's try a month where you live as if your body dysmorphic disorder is a mental health problem rather than being a physical problem. So just pretend for a month that there's not actually something wrong with you, there's something wrong with your mind um, and see how it goes. So I was like, I guess I don't have anything to lose and then having the really intense exposure therapy, working on my anxiety, um, that was a big change for me. Exposure therapy means deliberately facing your fears in a way that's therapeutic. To help someone stop their compulsions, the most important thing for them is first to consider the effect of these strategies and how much they may in fact be worsening their preoccupation with their appearance. I think one of the breakthrough moments for me for getting help was I slumped into depression and it became my normality. And as soon as I started to think that I could get rid of that, that I could get back to being the person that I enjoyed and actually start having fun again, that made recovery seem exciting and enjoyable rather than something that I was losing the anorexia, I was actually gaining my life back. Sometimes I tell myself that I actually have great love and respect for my body. It's really helpful to calm myself down, to remind myself of how much I've put it through and how it's survived, it's sprung back and forth. Sometimes if I can't adore it, love it, at least I can respect it. What's helped me most is having support from family and friends and that isn't necessarily them understanding where I'm coming from because mental health problems are really often irrational and won't make sense to them but just being there for me and trying to still listen and sort of validate the way I'm feeling. Recovery takes time and some days are better than others but if you are struggling, no matter how bad you feel right now, there is help out there. You just have to ask. Thank you so much and have a good one. Goodbye. Thank you guys. Yeah, I really love that video. Um, I think it does a really good job of ex disgusting. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah. Oh, the YouTube was blank. Sorry. <laughs> I think um, <laughs> it just did a really good job of explaining how it can affect multiple things. And um, I think I can definitely relate in a sense that, um, you know, I was on a medication. You know, I've always been very petite. And for like, I all, to, like, my dysmorphia was like going over a hundred pounds like I've always been under a hundred pounds so going over that was like gonna be detrimental to me um and it happened I was on a medication and I gained 20 pounds um you know that's a lot it was and that was just like um life altering you know it affected how what I wore like you know I wouldn't wear certain clothes um I felt always just always feeling uncomfortable 
Um, and that carries with you, right? Like into the workplace and into friends and into family. Um, I don't, didn't want to have sex with my husband because I felt freaking disgusting. Um, yeah, so it's just really eye-opening how that, you know, is part of my mental health because I would have never related that to my mental health um, whatsoever. And it's been part of the journey. Wow. Yeah, that was why I really liked that video. That was what I was sort of alluding to all along the way is not understanding in the grander scheme of things what was contributing on a larger, like it's, it just did a really nice job. And people are talking about like how you're your own enemy in those situations. So like, I won't look in a mirror. I won't do this thing or I won't do that. Um, it's, yeah. I just get into really bad. I usually do the overeating thing and I'm not someone that like purges much, but I'll eat into like, I will make myself feel sick or I will like, and it's sort of like, it becomes like a self loathing sort of deal where it's like, I'm not eating because it makes me feel better. I'm eating because it makes me feel worse. And, and which is, you know, it's crazy to say, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's so strange how that works. I'm an overeater too, um, because I'll, I won't eat all day. Um, I do this still, um, and I'll just gorge at night. I mean, it's not healthy. And you know, you go into it. Oh, I'm not. I'm just gonna have dinner and like whatever. But yeah, bad habits. Yeah, it all goes back to how we're feeling about ourselves, right? Like how, you know, what we're doing with these feelings inside, they come out, they're going to come out in some way. If we're not expressing ourselves healthfully, then they're going to come out in other ways. And a lot of times they come out through our eating and our body image. Well, um, I guess we can talk about right, eating. Right, because it's a, we haven't talked about this, but a control thing, like, you know, a lot of it is, well, I have control over something. Totally. Um, people with anorexia, out of control. totally. People with anorexia and bulimia tend to be perfectionists with low self-esteem who um, feel like they have little control in life and are extremely critical of themselves. And um, I just so relate to that because I remember when I first moved to Los Angeles when I was 19, I had like, my life was so out of control. Like I didn't have a job when I moved there and I had no money and I didn't have family support. Like, I mean, like emotional I mean, I didn't have financial family support, but I didn't have emotional family support either because they didn't want me to move out there at that time because I was dropping out of college to do so. And so there was a lot of family angst about this move. And it was kind of like, you know, I was like, felt like I had to go out there and prove myself and fend for myself. And I, um, that's when my eating disorder first flared up. Like I'd had like, I'd had little flare ups before that time through puberty, but like, it became a huge issue in my life around that time because it was the one thing that I could control. Like I didn't know where I was getting my next paycheck, if I had a paycheck, how I was going to pay my rent, but I could control like what I was putting in my body or what I wasn't putting in my body. And, um, and so I was going to put in as little as possible. And I was going to, if I fainted that day, like I, I made that happen. I controlled that, you know, like it was that feeling of like in this chaos of a world, like I can, keep my, I can keep the reins. And, um, and it just made everything even more chaotic. Of course, it didn't solve anything. It made everything worse. But, um, but I just really relate to that, to that feeling. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, I, I mean, it totally makes sense. I, I think that, you know, I've, it's, it's control. But then it's also like this obsession with food, right? Because yeah. You don't want to eat food or you are controlling what's going in your mouth. Um, so I've definitely had that. I mean, I have, yeah, I've had that throughout. Yeah, life. and I'll probably have it, I mean, as much as I don't want to and as perfect as I want to be about it and as much as I know that it's not necessarily the right way to treat myself, I'll have it again any minute now for whatever reason i mean chaotic world so more likely to sort of fall into that 
Because again, like Julia said, it's not, you're not really getting control. You have control of that moment or that, you know, the number of crackers that you consumed for a day. But it's, you, you know, you're taking, you know, your physical well-being sort of out of your own control because, and then you can potentially make it worse, which makes it worse. <laughs> yeah, it's an illusion. And then it just makes you more depressed. And then, you know, that can lead to other things. Like suddenly you're suicidal. Like I got suicidal then. And then, you know, all of a sudden I was taking all my diet pills, which had ephedra in them at the time, which could stop your heart. You know, taking bottles and bottles of diet pills to try and kill myself, to try and give myself a heart attack, you know, because I, um, because I couldn't see this illusion of control. Yeah. But there's not just one cause for an eating disorder. Um, it would be nice if there were, because we could point and be like, it's that, you know, but it's, it's a combination of things. It's genetics, it can be trauma. It can be your overall mental health. It can be your body image. Um, it can be a whole host of things, environmental fa factors, psychological factors, um, family factors, lots of different things. I, you were saying, Mel, that your dad um, um, kind of like instilled some poor body image ideals in you. Certain things like that can lead to an eating disorder. Yeah, and terrible, terrible self-esteem situations. So, I mean, it, a lot of my eating disorder, like any eating, any disordered eating that I do in my life is very much was, came from sort of that start of my life. Um, my mother was, you know, she was the beauty queen growing up in our small town. And she, you know, first runner up in the town pageants and things like that. And so my mother was sort of at the beginning of her life was, you know, very pretty and held up for, you know, put on a pedestal for pageant stuff and all of that. But, and I think it affected her poorly. And so she related her stuff back to it. So she didn't exactly have the tools to sort of step in on behalf of my sister and I and say, don't, don't do that. That's not gonna help them feel good about themselves, you like, you know, bagging on their eating habits in that sort of blatantly open sort of way. She wasn't going to have the tools because of her upbringing to step in on behalf of my sister and I, you know, having and having and my father's tools were, are you sure you want to eat that? You know, I had sisters and I know how miserable they were when they were overweight or too heavy. And it's like, whoa, that's not going to help my uh, body image. That's actually kind of the opposite of like positive reinforcement that I need. And my sister said something really telling to me in a fairly recent conversation. She said, well, mom's been on a diet my whole life. And I sat there for a minute and I really thought about that. And I was like, God, she's not kidding. And I don't, again, I don't think this is a bad thing. I think this is another one of these generational mental illness situations where we conflate sort of like this image of what is sold to us on. And that's, you know, that's interesting because that's pre, that predates internet and mass media on the scale that we know. And that still was passed to me through a couple generations. And then having a niece and my sister having, a, you know, I, like we were talking about parents before, it's like, yeah. How do I tackle that given that I have, I don't have or didn't have the great tools leading up to the time where it was my responsibility to try and instill a new person, a new human being with the right tools. And so, but I know that a lot of what I get down on myself first, it all goes back to that childhood stuff. Always. It's like, I get in that same sort of like want to hide in a hole. I'm ugly. No one wants to look at me. It's very, very, it's a, it's amazing how something that far away ago and so many years of, you know, therapy, I think that would be my biggest message to everybody is I've been at this for a good long time now. And I still have to sit down and reassess and remind myself that I'm not that little kid hiding in my room because I got, you know, chastised for eating one too many cookie. Cause that kid still comes out. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I feel like there needs to be, like, this needs to be taught in school now. Like, kids need to be taught outside of a home environment, like, about healthy habits. And maybe they do. I don't know. 
I think it's a community effort that we don't put in because a lot of times our money isn't utilized in the interest of those things. I don't think that it's bad intentions on the part of educators or childcare providers or parents. I think that when you're both, you know, you got two parents working 40 hours a week, balls to the wall all the time, you, you don't have time for healthy eating habits. So you're not going to have help time to instill healthy eating habits in your children. And I think that that cycle when we get down, I mean, everything we've talked about so far in the show has come down also to socioeconomic forces and the way that we run things today in our particular culture and society. And because I feel like if we got a hold on all of these things, especially knowing how much these body issues are linked to body dysmorphic disorder and how much bigger of a world that is and understanding where that comes from on another level that I just learned this week. I mean, if I have all these things to learn after my journey has gone on this long, then that means that the new people trying to learn about these things and all the new people coming to terms with their mental illness. I like the part at the end of that video where she talks about the fact that having the right words mm -hmm. to describe it to people. And I think we're getting there and that's going to be like the best ally we can, because if we can take that in and out of our homes and do that in the grocery store and at the schoolyard and as a community, that's always going to make it just better. Mm -hmm. Having that vocabulary. Yeah. Words help a lot. Well, um, eating disorders are actually, you know, can, are, are sadly are often, well, I won't say often, but, um, you know, more than, um, I guess often can be fatal. Um, and, uh, they're actually, um, more fatal than, more people die of eating disorders in one year than any other of the um, mental illness disorders. Um, so it can be very serious. But luckily, there is treatment. There are options. Um, you can do inpatient treatment. You can do individual therapy. You can do group therapy. You can do peer support groups. There's lots of different ways to go about it. But um, please get help if you are struggling, if you're having issues, and you're out there listening to this. You're not alone and there is help out there. So please reach out to someone. Yes. It's just crazy, uh, like, I know we keep saying this, but you know, before researching this topic, um, I, I would have never associated so many things um, about body image um, to be part of mental illness. Yeah, they separate, I don't know, it's not just, I mean, we're patients, and we didn't realize some of these links. So it shows you how far we have to go, I think, on building a better treatment plan for mental health. And that's why I think Absolutely. that things like that's us true. getting we together are. and talking about it, I mean, I think that yeah. that opens, I mean, just this, this conversation is a good learning experience for us, and hopefully for other people. And I can take that to the bank with me in terms of my treatment, understanding that, you know, hey, some of this stuff is actually part of my PTSD. It's because it is part of my mental illness. It's not a subset or a, it's actually part of it. Like it is part of the package. The whole thing is that, you know, those things sit together. Not, it's not just eating, it's, you know, you're not eating right. <laughs> it's like, yes, but there's a reason I'm not eating right. There's a way bigger reason than even I realized as to why I'm not doing that. Exactly. All these things are very intertwined. Yeah, and what affects what in life um, is, you know, crazy. Social media, friends, family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you yeah. are in... If you are in recovery from an eating disorder um, or you're considering getting help for an eating disorder, um, some there's some things to keep in mind um, as you go through your journey. Um, these are just a few tips. Uh, one is don't beat yourself up. Um, shame and eating disorders go hand in hand. So take that power away from your eating disorder. Don't sit in your shame, but um, practice, you know, try using affirmations instead of letting your self-critical thoughts get the best of you. Um, don't put the needs of others above yourself. 
I know that people often do that and they're, you know, called selfless, but this is actually the time for you. This is your recovery and your time. And you can't help anyone else if you're not healthy. So really take this time for you. What do you guys think about that one? I think that's such an important point. I mean, I think that we do even neglect ourselves when we're trying to care for ourselves, And because we, I mean, I know I definitely think about how my behavior affects others as much or maybe too much more than I do on getting that behavior under control. And I think that that is, um, it, it, the, one of the women in the video also talked about like loving their self for today, just getting through today and saying, for today, I'm going to pretend that everything is good and I can eat normal and be all right with myself just one one day at a time. I mean, it, it's a good mantra, but being proud of, she said, being proud of her body for what she's put it through and surviving that. And I thought that that was a really excellent spin on, like, oh, that not spin, it's a reframing of what you're really dealing with because that is really a part of your health and you should, you know, your body goes through a lot of stuff, but I have respect for it because it's still here and it's still fighting and it's still upright. And I liked that. I liked that mentality. I, it's easier said than done, but it's a way of looking at it that is new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to even get through one day at a time. Sometimes it's just like enough to get through five minutes. Like I'm going to get through these next five minutes and that's all I can do, but I'm going to do that. And then the next five minutes after that and so on. Um, another tip is don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, it can be really hard to reach out for help, but just remember asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help is one of the bravest things you can do. It is a sign of strength and, um, and your recovery will thank you for it. Um, so those just are a few tips to help you on your road to recovery. Um, I think to wrap this up, if we want to talk about um, ways we can improve our overall body image, because I think that's what it all comes back to. Yeah, let's do it. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Flip. I like avoid offending media. Absolutely. I think they're right. What we read <clears throat> and watch has a huge impact on how we feel about ourselves. And we talked a little bit about this one, but I think that that is, you have to be very mindful. That's where the mindful thing comes in. You have to. It's like, why am I doing this? This is not helping me. Mute it. I mean, there's a snooze and a mute button on those things. So even if you do it, like, I got in the habit of instead of like unfriending is I'll do the thing on Facebook where I mute somebody for 30 days. It'll pop right back up onto my thing. And I feel like if for those 30 days, I didn't really miss that influence, I can probably be done with it. And then I've given myself the birth that I need on social media, as it were. That's a good idea. It's, you know, because then you're not pulling the plug and you give yourself the idea. I realized that that snooze button on Facebook is actually one of my favorite things. I started using it just as a matter of politics because it gets pretty hot this time of year. But, uh, I noticed for a lot of people where it was like when they popped back up on my feed, I was like, wow, I didn't miss the influence of this person. So I think I'm just going to unfollow them. I gave myself sort of the time to not be like unilaterally on banned. Facebook, actually one of my favorite things. I started using it just as a matter of politics. What is that? Oh, <laughs> bounce back. Um, okay. Let's keep moving. Um, consciously seek out media that reinforces positive self image. I mean, absolutely. We talked about that earlier. <clears throat> Um, stay away from shopping centers and department stores. That one's interesting. Yeah, and then you won't spend money either. <laughs> true. But it's true, the lighting in department stores is awful, and I feel like my body always looks like crap. Um, avoid conversations about appearance. So touch your body gently. That sounds a little sexy. I know. <laughs> okay, but that, I got to get behind that. Um, 
head massage deal when they do your hair at the, I know it's not really the time and place for hairdressers and I haven't been to mine in a while, but that help, scalp massage, that does make a lot of difference in life. Well, do your own at home. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Or get, get the husband. Oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. Touch your body gently. All right. So meditate. <laughs> Katrina's favorite. My freaking favorite. Um, eat respectively, which means accept, accepting and being mindful of the nutrients that your body requires to function. So you don't, you know, you don't have to eat sugary things or fatty things, but you know, healthy things. Um, so the flip side of eating respectively is to move past the binge fast guilt cycle. So we don't want to obsess, basically, not obsessively. That one's a big one. Yeah, definitely. I think. Yes. And then replacing a negative thought with a positive one. I mean, I this is like the 101 of what, like, you know, your therapist is going to tell you, I feel like. And then the last one is finding a purpose. Which I think is huge. Because the more purpose we have, the less time we have to obsess about our bodies. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think those were all really good. I think Some they're all achievable. Like that, but it was good. They're all achievable things. Yeah. It's not a lot of like, do this or do, you know, it's, I mean, those are all things that you can do at home if you need to or without any, like, it, it can be pretty low impact on your life to be just that much more mindful don't eat the extra sweets because your body doesn't need sweets sweets are not nutrients no matter what you tell yourself darn it well cool any last thoughts oh, I think that's good I think we had a good conversation about this I learned a lot about this one so I'm do. glad Good topic, Julia. Thank you guys. Every like, thank you for joining in. If you're joining in, please like and subscribe, comment, um, and if you ever want to be on the show, just let us know. Find us here every Tuesday at eight. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you next week. Thanks. Bye.